If we transport ourselves back to the ages in which the religious life flourished most vigorously, we discover a fundamental conviction which we no longer share, and on account of which we see the door to the religious life once and for all closed to us. It concerns nature and our traffic with nature. In those ages, one as yet knows nothing of natural laws. Neither earth nor sky are constrained by any compulsion. A season, sunshine, rain, can come or they can fail to come. Any conception of natural causality is altogether lacking. When one rows, it is not the rowing which moves the ship. Rowing is only a magical ceremony by means of which one compels a demon to move the ship. All illness, death itself, is the result of magical influences. Becoming ill and dying never occur naturally. The whole conception of a natural occurrence is lacking. It first dawns with the older Greeks, that is to say, in a very late phase of mankind, in the conception of a moira enthroned above the gods. When someone shoots with the bow, there is still an irrational hand and force at work in it. If the wells suddenly dry up, one thinks first of all of subterranean demons and their knavery. It must be the arrow of a god, through whose invisible action a man suddenly sinks down. In India, according to Lubbock, a carpenter is accustomed to make sacrifices to his hammer, his axe, and his other tools. A Brahmin treats the crayon with which he writes, a soldier the weapon he employs in the field, a mason his trowel, a laborer his plow, in the same way. The whole of nature is, in the conception of religious men, a sum of actions by conscious and volitional beings a tremendous complex of arbitrarinesses. In regard to everything external to us, no conclusion can be drawn that something will be thus or thus, must happen thus or thus. It is we who are the more or less secure and calculable. Man is the rule. Nature is irregularity. This proposition contains the fundamental conviction which dominates rude, religiously productive, primitive cultures. We men of today feel precisely the opposite. The richer a man feels within himself, the more polyphonic his subjectivity is, the more powerfully is he impressed by the uniformity of nature. With Goethe, we all recognize in nature the great means of composure for the modern soul. We listen to the beat of the pendulum of this mightiest of clocks with a longing for rest, for becoming settled and still, as though we could imbibe this uniformity into ourselves, and thereby at last come to an enjoyment of ourselves. Formerly the reverse was the case. If we think back to rude, primitive conditions of peoples, or if we look closely at present-day savages, we find them determined in the strongest way by the law, by tradition. The individual is tied to them almost automatically and moved with the regularity of a pendulum. To him, nature, uncomprehended, dreadful, mysterious nature, must seem the domain of freedom, of caprice, of a higher power, indeed, as it were, a superhuman stage of existence, a god. But every individual living in such ages and conditions feels how his existence, his happiness, that of the family and the state, the success of any undertaking, depends on these arbitrarinesses of nature. Certain natural events must occur at the right time, others fail to occur. How can one exercise an influence over these terrible unknown powers? How can one fetter the domain of freedom? Thus he asked himself, thus he anxiously seeks. Are there then no means of regulating these powers through a tradition and law in just the way you are regulated by them? The believer in magic and miracles reflects on how to impose a law on nature. And, in brief, the religious cult is the outcome of this reflection. The problem these men pose themselves is intimately related to this one. How can the weaker tribe nonetheless dictate laws to the stronger, dispose of it, regulate its actions, so far as they affect the weaker? 
One will think first of that mildest kind of constraint, that constraint one exercises when one has gained the affection of someone. It is thus possible to exercise a constraint on the powers of nature through prayers and pleadings, through submission, through engaging regularly to give presents and offerings, through flattering glorifications, inasmuch as by doing so one obtains their affection. Love binds and is bound. Then, one can conclude treaties, under which both parties commit themselves to a certain course of conduct, pledge securities, and exchange oaths. But much more important than this is a species of more violent constraint through magic and sorcery. Just as man is able, with the aid of the sorcerer, to harm an enemy stronger than himself, just as the sorcery of love can operate at a distance, so the weaker man believes he can influence the mightier spirits of nature, too. The chief means employed by all sorcery is that of getting into one's power something belonging to another. Hair, nail, food from his table, even his picture or his name. Thus equipped, one can then practice sorcery. For the basic presupposition is that to everything spiritual there pertains something corporeal. With its aid, one is able to bind, harm, destroy the spirit. The corporeal provides the handle with which one can grasp the spiritual, so that as man influences other men, so he also influences some spirit of nature, for the latter too has its corporeal aspect by which it can be grasped. The tree, and, compared with it, the seed from which it originated, this enigmatic juxtaposition seems to demonstrate that one and the same spirit has incorporated itself in both forms, one small, one big. A stone that suddenly rolls away is the body in which a spirit is active. If a rock lies on a lonely heath and it seems impossible that human strength could ever have sufficed to take it there, it must have moved there itself, that is to say, it must harbor a spirit. Everything that has a body is accessible to sorcery. Thus, the spirits of nature are so too. If a god is actually tied to his image, then one can also exercise quite direct constraint upon him, through denial of sacrificial food, scourging, flattering, and the like. To force from their god the good will he is denying them, the common people in China wind ropes around his image, pull it down, and drag it along the streets through the mud and dung, you dog of a spirit, they say. We let you live in a splendid temple. We covered you with gold. We fed you well. We sacrificed to you. And yet you are so ungrateful. Similar violent measures have been taken against images of saints and of the Virgin in Catholic lands, even in the present century, when they have refused to do their duty in times of pestilence or drought. All these magical relationships with nature called countless ceremonies into existence. And finally, when their confusion had grown too great, an effort was made to order and systematize them, so that one came to believe that the favorable progress of the whole course of nature, and especially of the great succession of the seasons of the year, was guaranteed by a corresponding progress of a system of procedures. The meaning of the religious cult is to determine and constrain nature for the benefit of mankind, that is to say, to impress upon it a regularity and rule of law which it does not at first possess. While in the present age one seeks to understand the laws of nature, so as to accommodate oneself to them. In brief, the religious cult rests on the ideas of sorcery as between man and man, and the sorcerer is older than the priest. But it likewise rests on other and nobler ideas. It presupposes relations of sympathy between man and man, the existence of goodwill, gratitude, the hearing of petitions, treaties between enemies, the bestowal of pledges, the claim to protection of property. Even at very low stages of culture, man does not stand towards nature as its impotent slave. He is not necessarily its willless servant. At the stage of religion attained by the Greeks, especially in relation to the gods of Olympus, it is even as though two castes 
lived side by side, a nobler and mightier, and one less noble. But both somehow belong together in their origins and are of one species. They have no need to be ashamed of one another. That is the element of nobility in Greek religiosity. <laughs>